question now. Welcome everyone to um, the presentation of the artificial intelligence curriculum at Johannes Kepler University Linz. Uh, my name is uh, Johannes Kofler. I'm a university assistant at the Institute of Machine Learning and also member of the study commission of artificial intelligence and the deputy program manager. So what is the topic of our next 40 minutes? Um, I will uh, start uh, with a quick uh, summary slide on the curriculum itself. Then we will talk about AI. We will uh, see its definition. We will observe that it's a very interdisciplinary subject. Uh, we see its impact on society and economy. Uh, and we will discuss some modern applications. And then in the second part of the talk, I will uh, talk about the study program, about our distance learning uh, philosophy, the study plans of the bachelor's and master curriculum, and the qualification profile, and also the admission criteria for the master's. And after my talk, uh, Niklas Schmiedinger, who is a, a senior master student of artificial intelligence, will, will give you some further insights from the student perspective. Okay, so. We started uh, the artificial intelligence program in October 2019, and simultaneously we started the bachelor's and master's program. So master students uh, already, uh, are, some of them are finished already after four or five semesters, and our first bachelor cohort is now in the sixth semester. So we do not have finished bachelor students yet, but we will have them in summer. Uh, we do not have any formal access restriction in the sense that there would be a closed number or an exam you have to take. Um, this is simply not installed. We are open in that sense. We were among the first AI programs in Europe uh, and the first AI program in Austria. And I still think we are one of the few modern AI programs um, in, in, in Europe. We fully teach in English, so it's really 100% uh, of our mandatory or elective courses are offered in English, so without any German proficiency, you, you can uh, complete the whole curriculum. We are largely available also via distance learning, also the student is designed that students reside in close proximity to Linz, Prague, and Vienna. more details on that later. We are a technical program, uh, so you should like mathematics and you should like programming. Uh, but we also have a wider scope. We have uh, subjects uh, that uh, look on the topics of AI and society, sociological and even legal consequences. Our bachelor's program is a standard Bologna type six semester program with 180 ECTS. Um, it's fundamentally interdisciplinary with a foundational education in computer science and mathematics and some core AI subjects. Details on that also in the second part of the talk. Master's program, also standard, I would say, uh, in the Bologna system, four semesters, 120 credits, uh, with a heavy focus on uh, deep learning, which is uh, the uh, uh, most uh, successful branch of artificial intelligence in the last decade. And we have four elective tracks there in mechatronic, symbolic AI, and in the life sciences. So let us jump into what is artificial intelligence. It's actually not so easy to define, and uh, there is uh, not a complete consensus uh, in the whole community, but there is a kind of consensus, namely that artificial intelligence refers to the ability of machines to perform cognitive tasks commonly associated with human intelligence, including perception, learning, reasoning, planning, speech and language, and also taking actions, which goes to the field of robotics. So you can see already that th this, is, this is a very broad uh, field. Uh, which links to what we believe humans do, and of course now machines should do it. So there's uh, lots of room for uh, debate and details here. One uh, very important um, contribution to this field was by Alan Turing in 1950. He's one of the founding fathers of uh, computer theory, um, and he designed the so-called Turing test. And it should show that the computer shows consciousness or, or intelligence. And the Turing test means that um, you have um, a human uh, uh, be, uh, behind a wall and uh, beyond the wall, there is either a computer or a human. And the human of course says he's a human or she, and also the computer pretends to be a human. And if the human C cannot decide on whether behind the wall 
there's a human or computer with, uh, what he, with which or whom he's interacting, then the computer passed it to interest. And in the early thought experiment, this was via text messages. So you submit text messages, you get text back, and can you decide whether this is a human or not? And modern programs already passed the Turing test, and at least they can pretend to be a teenager that is not native in the language and, and has maybe some hiccups. But this, uh, this can be passed by, by text messages, but not only by text. It can be passed by composing music. Juries cannot decide anymore who composed the music or who played it, actually. It can also be uh, passed by paintings. So on the bottom right, you see eight paintings. And all of them passed the jury in the Art Basel in 2017. And they're all computer generated. The jury didn't know. So, and not only that, artificial intelligence is able to even have superhuman performance. Many tasks I will show you later can be solved by modern AI techniques, which cannot be solved anymore by humans. So in many respects, uh, we, we already lost the run or the race. So AI um, is uh, related to many other fields of science. It's itself a sub-branch of computer science. It's heavily uh, related to mathematics. We have quite a focus on math education. Uh, it has this relationship via the uh, cognitive and sociological sciences, to also to philosophy and psychology. The whole field of bioinformatics was tackled by machine learning already since the 1990s. So it has this, this um, these connections to related fields. And as I mentioned earlier, and as we saw in the definition, AI itself is composed of many subdisciplines, planning, robotics, natural language processing, perception, knowledge representation and reasoning, and also neural networks and machine learning, where we have a heavy focus here in NIMS. Yeah, what actually is the relationship between artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning? Because when you read about AI in the news, and in almost all circumstances in the news, you mean deep learning, because this is what is the most successful field in the last 10 years. But AI itself is actually this very broad field, and we teach uh, in subjects in the whole field of, of AI. It dates back to the 50s, after Samuel trained two IBM PCs to play checkers against each other. The perceptron was the first um, artificial neuron uh, algorithm. And uh, Joseph Weizenbaum's ELISA was a rudimentary chatbot. And then in the 1980s, the subfield of machine learning, so one of these subfields here on the right hand side, emerged as a very successful branch. Uh, it was able to do optical character recognition when you scan the document. That was really game changing. Probably all of you are too young to, to still cherish this, but that was really a cool thing that you could scan a document and convert it into text. And only machine learning could do that. Um, uh, spam filters were uh, formed by machine learning. The whole field of genomics in the late 90s started off, and also the first Google search engines. They were all based on, on, on machine learning techniques. And then, about 10 years ago, plus minus, the so called deep learning revolution started. And all the modern achievements in image, text, voice, music, video recognition, and processing, uh, whenever you, you read it about autonomous driving, or about AlphaGo playing board games or strategic games, or um, um, AlphaFold, which I will talk later about. These are all achievements of deep learning, where deep neural network are trained. And why, why did this start in 2010? Because the theory was already in the 80s and 90s, it was already developed. But then the AI winter came and nothing happened because we were lacking two things. We, I mean, I mean all of us, society, um, namely fast computers, and large data sets. And this started around 2010, that computers were fast enough to train deep networks and that we had large, nicely labeled um, data sets. And this started the deep learning revolution. And uh, I know it's very uh, placative, but if you ask yourself, where does the electricity come from in my uh, power socket in the wall? Then of course it needs a resource. You need uh, oil uh, or coal or wind or solar or nuclear power, but some, some, you need a resource for the electricity. And what is the resource for modern artificial intelligence? The resource is data, 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 and fast computers. So this is something one can have in mind. There is no modern AI without lots of heavy loads, large, huge masses of data, nicely labeled, and fast computers to process them. Um, we believe that AI will be omnipresent and uh, pervade commercial applications 
can fundamentally change how businesses operate in virtually all sectors of industry and economy. Um, in information technology, we already uh, see that uh, since many, many years, uh, all of you have a smartphone with, uh, with, to which you can talk or automatic translation software. So all the modern speech and image recognition and translation software, this is all based on, on, on modern AI methods. In manufacturing and supply chains, um, AI helps to optimize production delivery uh, processes. So the whole field of logistics uh, and, and, and optimization problems um, can be um, tackled there. In medicine and healthcare, AI can help to uh, reach better diagnosis and evaluations. And in the field of drug design, um, a, a colleague of mine has a, has a group on this. Uh, chemoinformatics, it helps you to predict, uh, for instance, toxicity or other functional um, uh, characteristics of molecules. Um, so also in, in the whole field of, of uh, pharmacology and drug design, um, artificial intelligence already plays a big role and probably will grow to do so. In education, news, publishing, marketing and services, we have uh, classical recommender systems. They might not be um, uh, deep learning, but, but for sure they are artificial intelligence and machine learning. And in transportation, um, we get that almost every day in the news, um, self-driving cars and trucks are a goal we hope to achieve in the next maybe five or 10 years, or if you are um, pessimistic, then maybe longer. But anyway, all of this is based on deep learning. There is no way that you can program hard-coded hard the uh, all the scenarios that can be on the road. So if you see that, then do that, and if that, then do that. that that's not the way uh, modern AI works. You start off with a neural network and you train it in the um, in the real process, and then it learns to behave also in situations it has never seen. This is the magic of modern artificial intelligence that networks can generalize to situations they have never seen not like a standard computer program that can only do what you programmed it to do. And in some sense, this does really mimic us humans, because if you make a driver's license, then you go on the road for 20 or so hours, you study the theory, make, you make a test and you get the driver's license. And you are believed to behave well in situations you have, you have never seen. Nobody can look in your brain to see the command, if red light, then stop. You can't really extract it out of your brain, but it's still there somewhere in a neural net. Um, the impact on economy uh, is still predicted to be very large. So um, five years ago, I, I found uh, some, some numbers from Accenture, McKinsey and so on that predicted that AI doubles the annual GDP growth rate until 2035. Um, today, I tried to update this. I found the 2018 Coopers projection, for instance, which predicts that um, in Northern Europe um, in the next uh, 12 years, there is a 10% uh, gap in GDP growth, so almost a percent per year, uh, which we get if we are ahead in the AI boom and don't get left behind. So if we can adopt artificial intelligence in our industry and economy uh, compared to if we do not so. If we lag behind, we use a 1% GDP growth uh, per year, which is a lot. So maybe a bit pathetically, but um, the wealth of nations uh, may depend on, on that topic. It's really a, a, a mega trend, if you wish, artificial intelligence. Yeah, and also I found this graph uh, today when I updated my slides that um, the global investment in AI, into AI, uh, jumped to a record high actually last year. And uh, I, it's now blocked by my own video, but um, what is it now? Almost $80 billion. Uh, uh, in 2021. Yeah, and who is leading in AI? It's the US and China. Europe is still very good when it comes to basic research. So we have equally good institutions in Europe as um, in the US uh, or China. When it comes really to startups, funding, venture capital and so on, US and China is, is leading the way. Yeah. Of course, there's no time to, to, to talk about details here, but uh, since it's so important to us and also in our curriculum, uh, what is deep learning? What are deep neural networks? Well, these are these huge networks of actually many layers and in every layer, uh, maybe thousands of neurons. So in total, there might be uh, uh, millions of connections or, uh, or even more between the individual neurons. And then you start feeding, for instance, pictures into the first layer. 
Then there's a forward pass, and in the end comes a prediction, horse, dog, or cat, for instance. And in the beginning, the network is still very stupid, and it will make wrong predictions. But then you tell what the correct answer would have been, for instance, horse. And the network is punished if it got it wrong. And all the weights change a little bit. So if the next time it sees a horse, it will do better. And if you show it uh, thousands or millions of pictures, it will be very good in predicting. And it will also be good on a test set. It will also predict correctly whether you show a horse, dog, or cat, for instance, on an image it has never seen because it has learned from the test data, oh, sorry, from the training data, uh, what are the basic ingredients that make up a horse, dog, or cat. And designing these networks, training these networks, uh, how the connections should look like, how error functions should look like, and so on. This is an art. This you have to learn and study for many years. And this is why we need people like you who study this and bring the field forward. Once you have trained the network, so once you have invested the money and uh, found the data set and, and did all this, uh, neural networks are extremely fast in processing. So this is why you can upload them on a car and simply go driving in there. And uh, a video I particularly like is, is, is the following one. It's called AI Poly Vision. It's, it's an app for blind or visually impaired people. And they simply can start it on the phone, walk around, and the phone tells them what they see in the real world. And this uh, indeed was completely unthinkable 10 years ago. If you showed that to someone 10 years ago, it would have been like, like magic. Um, today, this app uh, has processed billions of images. It can recognize 5,000 different objects in the real world and tell you in 26 languages what you need to see. So let's have a quick look at the video, just a minute or so. I will stop it. It's too long otherwise, but it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, so let's come to a couple of other few cool things uh, AI is able to do. One are so-called uh, generated serial networks. There you use two uh, networks that play against each other. One is trying to fake or produce something, and the other network is trying like a referee to judge whether this is a fake or whether this is a real, for instance, image from a real data set. And these networks play against each other, and they become very good, both of them. And this reminds of, on what Arthur Samuel did uh, back in the uh, 50s, it was, with uh, playing um, uh, checkers against each other with two PCs. So for instance, if you look at these eight images, you can um, try to decide for yourself of what you think is a real person and what isn't. And you might find, uh, if you look closely, some mistakes. So for instance, here, this ear is much larger than this, so this is generated. But it's still very good. And in the end, all of these pictures are fake. None of this is a, is, a, is a real person. And this reminds us to the first slide I showed you with these pictures in the, in the art exhibition. Uh, and these uh, generative adversary networks, they can change uh, paintings to photos, horses to zebras, summer to winter landscape. You can simply train them on such problems. And then they can do that for a new input. And this also gives rise to these deep fake videos where you see politicians uh, of other famous people giving a speech, which they never did, because you simply take some other reference video and then some actor moves the face and talks, but the original face and voice is used. And uh, another very important topic, reinforcement learning, we teach it both in the bachelor's and in the master's program, um, is a very general setup where agents take actions in environment uh, to maximize the rewards. This is very related to all optimal control theory. And for instance, you could think of the problem you have a drone and you throw it in the air and it should not crash. Now you could try to program it, stabilize it, where is the gravity, where are the accelerations. And of course you could do that. You could write a program that 
and stabilize itself. But it's very hard because there is infinitely many ways you can start throwing it. In reinforcement learning, you would simply program a general reinforcement learning environment. And every time you throw it, the drone would start with some policy and actions. And if it crashes, it was wrong. And if it survives long in the air, it would reinforce that. And in the end, it will learn how to stabilize itself, just like a baby learns how to walk. And this modern um, uh, uh, achievements in uh, board games and, and other related fields, they all base on, on deep reinforcement learning. So for instance, uh, I mean, you're probably all very much younger than me, but um, it was a very cool thing that in the end of the 90s, IBM uh, was able to beat the best living chess player, Karik Kasparov, uh, 3.5 to 2.5 uh, in a position hard-coded value program. So this was just a brute force computer program. It had all the beginnings and endings, and in the middle, it valued a queen is worth nine points, a rook is worth five points, and it just tried out everything and then took the best move it had. And since then, no human can ever uh, can ever um, beat uh, uh, um, can ever win a, in, in chess against the best computer. Go is a different game. It's uh, older, simpler, and much more complex than chess. And even medium players um, are better than the best brute force computer programs in the world. Um, Go is too complex to brute force code Go. But um, DeepMind, a total company of, of Google, uh, designed AlphaGo in 2017. And it has beaten Kajir, the best player in the world, by three to zero, with a position valued uh, by a deep neural net. And since then, this is again game over for humans. We can never win in Go again. And this is even worse uh, in the sense that uh, AlphaGo Zero was designed later. This just knows the rules of Go, and there are only three rules in Go, and then it plays against itself. It doesn't even need any reference games or any human knowledge. It starts playing against itself. After three days, it has master levels. After three weeks, it's on the performance of the best human that ever lived, and then the sky is the limit. So it's a deep reinforcement learning Monte Carlo tree search mo uh, model, just playing against itself, just knowing the rules, and in three weeks better than any human ever will be or beat again. So this is in some sense extremely cool, a bit sad also, depends on your worldview. Um, the last uh, example in that direction I want to give because it also is a complete game changer. I have some colleagues in pharmaceutical companies and in structural biology and to everyone I talk. Um, and it also was science breakthrough of the year. Uh, so this is, was really a big thing. Also deep mind again, uh, alpha fold. So, Understanding protein structures is something like the holy grail in, in, um, in biology for decades. So I give you the protein sequence, ATCG, and I ask you, how does it look in real three-dimensional space? And it's extremely hard. And for many, many years, there has been a challenge where a data set was designed. People were given the sequences, and they were asked, give us your predictions. And then you can measure the the correctness of the prediction simply between zero and 100%. And there was a plateau. Nothing really happened until 2016, where you had a 40% overlap with the prediction. And then the first version of Alpha 4 came, and it already made a jump. And um, uh, two years ago, in 2020, Alpha 4 reached almost 90% accuracy, which is good enough to make prediction. Will the protein fit through this channel? Will it talk there? So 90% is, is enough for most practical purposes. And um, this, is, this is really amazing and a game changer in the field. Now you, you can use, um, at least for a wide variety of, 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 of molecules, you have now a prediction network that predicts the 3D structure just from the, from the sequence of amino acids. Okay. That brings me to the end of the first part, namely, what about this real AI we see in movies, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, iRobot, whatever you are a fan of. And this question is completely open. Nobody knows how far away we are from the so-called artificial general intelligence, or strong AI, it's also called. So this would be a hypothetical machine with behavior at least as skillful and flexible as we humans are. And we might be 10 years away from that. We might be 100 years away from that. We might never reach it. It's unclear how our brain really works because 
all what we do in AI and even in deep neural networks, it's not really how the brain works. So the human brain is still quite a mystery and we don't really know whether this we can reach. What we, what we can probably reach is the computing power of the human brain. So it's not that the computing power will save us from that. Because if you look at the, at the chart here, uh, it's a logarithmic chart. So here, every jump on the vertical axis is a factor uh, versus uh, here, second world war to now. And it shows the uh, operations per second of the best computer in the world. So and in the second world war, there was like one operation per second that the computer could do. And in the 1950s, it was already uh, tens of thousands of operations. So don't, don't let be misguided by this linear line. This is a logarithmic graph. And what you see here is simply one of the miracles of, of mankind that throughout uh, almost a decade, we were able by so-called Moore's law to double the power every 18 months or so. Today, you can buy a GPU for a thousand euros that is as powerful as the most expensive and most powerful computer uh, 20 years ago. And what you see above here in the orange bar, this is not just uh, uh, an orange rectangle, it should show you the estimated human brain power. The human brain is estimated to have between 10 to the 18 and 10 to the 25 operations per second. And our fastest computers probably can reach that in some amount of time. So we already see a deviation from Moore's law, but not much is missing. It depends on your worldview, whether you are an uh, utopist or, uh, or, or whether you have a dystopic worldview. Uh, but we all don't know uh, whether this is desirable and whether we will reach this or not to have a strong game. Okay, now I come to the second part of my talk, uh, which is the study program itself. Uh, we already had this introduction slide in the beginning. Uh, I will not go through it again because um, we will come to details anyway now on the next slides. And what I promise to tell you is um, our distance learning philosophy. So our curriculum uh, has two pillars. Uh, and you do not even have to decide which pillar you take. You can choose the course by course. You don't even need to tell us. All courses take place with physical presence at JKU. You can come to the lecture hall. You can come to the seminar rooms, just as all the regular studies here at our universities. Of course, Corona rule applies. We had lockdowns. Now you still have to wear a mask as far as I know. If there is a lockdown again, well, there is a lockdown and you can lock down. But apart from Corona rules, uh, we are a regular study uh, here in Linz, just as mathematics, physics, computer science, and so on. However, if you want, uh, you can simply also take advantage of our distance learning philosophy. So the, our curriculum is largely available via distance learning. What does it mean largely available? It means that the course contents are, of all courses are available online to some extent. So lecture notes or slides are, are, are online. Almost all courses are at least either live streamed and or recorded in the lecture hall, such that you can watch it via our learning platform Moodle for at least two weeks. So many colleagues and uh, myself included, uh, our recordings are online for the full semester until the week exams. Um, whenever there are exercises, and very often you have to not only go to the lecture, but also the exercises, you can choose whether you want to come to the seminar room or you want to go to the online group. And the online group might be free in the sense that you submit your work. It might demand virtual presence. So it might demand that on a, I don't know, Thursday afternoon, you have to log in and be present virtually, but you don't have to come to Linz. Um, similarly with exams, many exams are still online anyway. As Corona gave that really a boost. Uh, lots of lecturers went to online exams and some stay there. But still, we do have on-site exams. And for these on-site exams, we are, we are very proud to meanwhile offer three options. You can not only write them here in Linz at Johannes Kepler University, but we also have the distance learning centers in Vienna and in Bregenz. So if you live in some close proximity to Linz, Vienna, or Bregenz, uh, this is where you can write your written exams. The number of required days of physical presence at Johannes Kepler University, except the exams, is only about one per year. So you might have to come for a matriculation. Some seminar might demand really a presentation uh, here. Uh, there are some courses where you have to fetch hardware and give it back, but it's very, very little. So you almost don't have to come to Linz at all. Um, but then there are the exams. And for the exams, there are some of them really are not online, but written, and then you have to, have to come to Linz, Bregenz, Indiana. 
So the curriculum has been designed for students residing in close proximity to Linz, Bregenz, and Vienna, and not for people that live too far away, because then you would have to travel uh, for, 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 for every exam. Yeah, enrollment uh, is the same for all curricula, so I simply uh, invite you to go to the web page. And uh, if you have any questions about the admission process beyond what I will tell you later, um, you also can, can uh, find, uh, you can write an email to that address telling you general admission rules. The specific admission rules about AI, I will tell you today. Um, so let's uh, go to the bachelor's program in EI, uh, six semesters, 180 credits. Uh, yeah, fully in English and with distance learning elements. It's designed as a full-time program. So if you are a full-time student, you can start it in six semesters. If you study part-time, uh, it will simply um, take longer. Um, this is uh, the study plan. Uh, of course, we will not go through this list in detail here. It would suffice to know that we have several subjects. One is in AI basics and uh, practical work. Uh, where you have an hands-on course uh, where you immediately uh, uh, deal with some machine learning techniques and can play around with them from the very beginning, so from the first week. Um, we have uh, a sociological um, um, or AI and society subject, which is a lecture series and similar courses. You will learn the basics of the computer science program, of course, not the full computer science uh, curriculum, but the, the basics, uh, which means you in our curriculum, you will learn Python. This is the only language you need, but you will learn it uh, in full and algorithms and data structures. We have a very large data science subject where you learn statistics, visual analytics, um, natural language processing, digital signal processing, um, and uh, similar subjects. Then we have our symbolic AI or logical knowledge and um, knowledge representation and reasoning subject, where you will learn about knowledge and formal models. It's also one of the branches in AI. And uh, then uh, a focus on machine learning and perception. You will learn about the supervised and unsupervised techniques in machine learning, the two main fields, and reinforcement learning, the third main field. So you will learn about all main fields, uh, including uh, deep learning to some extent. Yeah, and uh, as I also mentioned, I think earlier, uh, you will have quite um, a, a um, strong education in mathematics. Um, we have a three part course and then an optimization course in the fourth semester. So the mathematics amount of uh, in our curriculum is not as much as a pure mathematics curriculum would have, but it's significantly more than a computer science um, program would have. And in Linz, we are on equal level with, for instance, the physicists or, or electrical engineers. So we are on the second highest level in the mathematic education after the mathematicians themselves and our level together with physicists and so on. Mathematics is very important in AI. You should like mathematics and you should like uh, programming. Um, what's the qualification pro profile for the bachelor's program? The admission criterion is a matura. It's the school leaving exam in Austria after uh, 12 years of school. So you start with six years, and when you are 18 or 19, after 12 or 13 years, depending on the school type, um, you leave school, and with the matura, you can start. If you come from a foreign country, you need an equivalent uh, degree, uh, so high school leaving degree, and potentially a certificate showing proficiency in English on the I don't know whether it's the B1 or B2 level. Um, that's uh, the university decides that not the program itself. Um, we offer a broad and balanced foundational education in math and computer science and specialized training in core subjects like machine, machine learning, uh, data science, um, symbolic AI, natural language processing. Uh, you will learn about also the broader ethical implications uh, of AI for society. We focus on your uh, systematic problem solving capabilities. We also want to promote the social competences in some teamwork or practical training. And we really want that you acquire skills that you immediately can use for your later careers, which means there are two, two possible goals of the bachelor's program. Either you continue with a master studies, not necessarily in AI, you can switch to another field through the Bologna system, but the, that bachelor program should prepare you either if you want to go on with a master's program or for an immediate entry to the job market. So we believe that the, our bachelor program covers all 
uh, you need to be able to develop AI solutions in many different sectors of industry and economy. That brings me to the last part, the master's program, four semesters, 120 credits, uh, English optional distance learning, and, and uh, again, designed as a full-time program. But uh, as far as I know, the last number I saw more than half of our master's study students have uh, a part-time job. So not 40 hours, but, but it's, it's, it's actually the same in the computer science curriculum, in computer science and AI. The master students, they all, uh, many of them have part-time work and then continue later. So there yeah, we have four elective tracks, uh, two are in mechatronics. Uh, so you have to look here at the third one. Uh, um, we have a mechatronics, robotics and autonomous system tracks, an embedded intelligence and signal processing track, and reasoning and knowledge representation track. This now will be called symbolic AI and mathematical foundations. And we have an elective track in the life sciences. So these are the four elective tracks. You are either inclined to mechatronics or to the life sciences or more formally to symbolic AI and mathematics. And apart from that, uh, we again have a couple of credits in AI and society. You will learn about AI and law and also about um, communicating AI and, and proper psychology. And the main focus in the master is up here, machine learning and perception. You will learn about uh, very deeply <laughs> about deep learning, about recurrent nets and LSTM, computer vision, explainable AI and probabilistic models. So we have a heavy, heavy focus on deep learning. So uh, machine learning in particular, deep learning and perception. Um, so the qualification profile here is a thorough education in the modern developments in the field of AI, in particular deep learning, also practical training with connections to the legal system, sociological implications. Uh, I mentioned the four elective tracks already. Uh, why are the two in mechatronics? Because uh, Johannes Kepler University is very strong in that field and it has lots of relations to the local industry. So we thought uh, it makes sense to split it up into those people that are interested more in the robotics field or more into the embedded intelligence and signal processing field. Yeah, and to people that come maybe from a more mathematical background, we have third track and for all people that more are interested in biology, chemistry and so on, relations to AI, the life science track is the right one. Yeah, the, I mentioned already the, the strong local industrial environment and what's the goal of our master's program? The goal is to prepare you either, for, and that should be the goal of every decent master program, to prepare you either for subsequent PhD studies or for the entry into the job market. And of course, if you already do it for the bachelors, it's for sure true for the masters. Uh, the master students we had until now that, that finished, they all, uh, as far as I know, uh, immediately uh, could um, um, deploy their knowledge in, in, uh, in the job market. That brings me to the last part. And uh, from my experience with these presentations, it's also it's always a very important part for the ones that want to join the master's program. What are the admission criteria? And this is actually the, the last slide I have, and then I'm done with my talk. We have, in fact, three broad categories in which you can fall. Very few of you will fall into the first category because there are almost no such people in Europe yet. If you have a bachelor's degree in artificial intelligence, or at, at our university or at equivalent, but there are not many in Europe, then you simply join our program and that's it, no admission criteria. And all our bachelor students will have that, that finish now. Most people that started our master's degree within the last two and a half years, our master's curriculum, fell into the second category. They had a bachelor's degree in a related technical discipline. What does it mean? Computer science. Uh, I have my video over what was that? Uh, mathematics, technical mathematics, physics, uh, mechatronics, um, electronics, um, natural sciences, business informatics, bioinformatics, or equivalent, uh, civil engineer, or whatever. So, if you have the, the rule of thumb is if you have a bachelor's degree that had a nice track in mathematics, so if you know what calculus is, integration and differentiation in multivariables and you can calculate the determinant of a matrix and you learn the programming language, not necessarily Python, because we believe then you can switch very fast. If you have a mathematics and programming knowledge, you will fall into the second category. You can enter our master's program without any additional admissions. All we ask you is that within the 120 credits, namely within the area of specialization of free elective, 
subjects you have to choose. You have to, if you have not done so already anyway at the home institution, you have to cover the supervised machine learning and the unsupervised machine learning in some statistics course. Most people have a statistics course anyway in the technical curriculum. And supervised and unsupervised techniques is just the two most basic course from the bachelor degree. And it's unacceptable that you finish a master's without having that. That's why we force you to do it within your 120 CPS. But you can still study easily in four semesters. And then there is a smaller number of people that come with another non-technical bachelor degree. And then we look at the certificate you have and the courses you took, and we may still allow admission. And in most cases we do, and we give you usually then up to 40 additional credits covering the mathematics, the programming, the supervised and unsupervised techniques. So if you have a non-technical degree, but are super interested in AI, you can go for that option. We will give you 40 credits. You will need one year for these 40 credits. You will study math and programming, and then you enter the usual, and then you do the usual master's course. Of course, you could do it differently, but that would be recommended. Then you, you can do it within three years. Okay, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, further information, of course, can be found on the web. This, this address is very long. It's best to just Google AI JKU. And then among the first hits in Google, you will find the web pages of our bachelor's and master's curriculum. Yeah, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, if you have any questions, uh, they will be answered uh, after um, uh, my colleague Niklas Schmiedinger will finish uh, his talk. And to all that watch this video later on, uh, if something uh, remains unclear to you, uh, write an email to the uh, Linz Institute of Technology Artificial Intelligence Lab office, email address is given here, and or to myself. So with this, again, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. I hope to uh, uh, be able to answer your questions later on uh, and to see maybe some of you in our program at the later stage. I will now stop my um, uh, video sharing and hand over the floor to Mr. Nika Schmidinger. Thanks. Let me just quickly start my presentation. Okay, can you hear me and uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so my name is Niklas and I will now give you a bit of a student's perspective um, about the distance learning program at the JKU in the AI Masters. Um, so let's first start with a bit of personal background about myself. So I completed my bachelor's degree here in Vienna and I started in winter 2019 at the JKU AI master's program as part of the first cohort of students in this uh, new studies. And currently I'm also working at the JKU life science group uh, here in Vienna on uh, deep learning for medical imaging. And uh, I spent the majority of my studies in Vienna and occasionally in Vorarlberg from which I'm originally. So I did um, basically all of my um, master's studies um, fully, fully in the distance um, version. Um, just a brief overview, uh, what I'm going to cover now. So first I will go a bit into more depth into like how does the distance learning work and what my experiences are with it. And uh, Johannes already talked a, a bit about it. Um, then, may, then I will talk about the, uh, some of my personal highlights with the distance study. Um, and then I will also talk about a bit the concerns that I had before I uh, actually started studying. Um, and, and I will also talk about how um, the JKU addresses all of these concerns. And because I was uh, asked this last year, I, I will also talk a bit about like uh, how, how is the study like compatible with um, like work. Um, as we already heard, like a, the majority of master's students are working. Um, so first, how does the, um, the, the, how does the distance learning uh, look like and how does it work? So, um, Basically, what you do is um, you can go to the distance learning center and watch the lecture. So the, the lecturer who is um, located in, in Linz, um, these lectures will be live streamed to the distance learning centers in Vienna and uh, in Bregenz as well. And there you can also interact with the, uh, with the lecturers either via microphone or via chat. So you just like post your questions in the chat room. And uh, the lecturer will go through the chats like at uh, regular intervals and like will try to answer them. Or if you speak through the microphone, 
they will hear you in the uh, in the lecture room and they will they will answer you um, and alternatively you can also just stream the lectures live uh, remotely so if you just want to watch them at home you can do that so this is like mm, possible for most lectures um, and of course um, usually the lectures they are uh, recorded and uh, you can you can view them later and this the the um, recordings are mostly available for the entirety of the semester um, or for a few weeks after the lecture so this depends a bit on the on the lecture and on the course so this is very convenient because if you cannot attend live or like you're not available uh, you can just rewatch the lectures um, and and as as johannes already said the exams uh, are written at the distance learning centers or like during corona they were um, uh, they were of course online and now apparently some are staying but usually you have to go to either either of the distance learning centers to complete these exam when you're being tested um, and also occasionally presentations or some group work is done at these uh, distance learning centers so you have to be like in um, close proximity uh, to to these uh, uh, locations and uh, the exercise teams they often consist of students in different locations so you are like mm, mostly working together with students from um, from other locations and it's kind of like a, a mix so this is how it works and maybe some personal highlights what i really liked about the, the distance study so i think it's very nice for work-life balance because it gives you like a tremendous amount of um, flexibility um, and you can you can study close to vienna to linz or bregenz and there's really no hard choice required so you don't have to like um um, start a study in Vienna and stay there, but you could go to Linz or to, to Bregenz and um, basically you have the, the, the free choice. And in theory, like as already mentioned before, it's even possible to spend some time abroad um, and, and study like completely remotely. But this, of course, uh, depends on the courses and for the exams, you just have to be there. So either you, you travel to one of the locations that are um, available or, or you just um, you just live in like one of the, the cities there. Um, I think it offers like a great like great flexibility with work because attendance for most courses is not strictly um, mandatory. Um, but but this is also like for some courses you have to be there. But but it it still like gives you like a lot of freedom because I in in my studies like I I wasn't um, the so it, it, the attendance was not very strict I would say. Um, and what I also liked is like the distance learning really enabled like connections beyond your study locations. So what I did sometimes I went to Linz and I met people from there. I also worked in teams with uh, people from Linz. Now, now Vorarlberg also joined. Um, and, and I think like uh, you can really also meet people that are not in, in your local location. And I think in uh, another thing that I also like very much is like there is just like a very colorful mix because some people are studying from other places. So you like you really get to know people with like different backgrounds and experience, and I found this like pretty cool. Um, so before I started studying, I had of course some concerns about like this uh, distance mode, um, and now I will go through each of these concerns that I had, and um, we will see how um, JKU like addresses them. So maybe let's just uh, start with the first one. So the first thing that I feared was that there won't be like um, any interaction with other students and that, that there is basically no serendipity in the sense of like you, you don't meet like people randomly if you're just like studying remotely and um, you're just at home. Um, but I found this uh, to be um, like not true in the end. So because the distance learning center really served as kind of like the initial meeting point, especially in the, in the beginning of the semester, where you really go there and meet like the local people. So I went to the distance center in Vienna and I met basically my, um, all like, like my new colleagues and my new friends there. Um, and, and this is like really a place for, for gathering. And so um, you, you get the opportunity to, um, to interact with like locals there. And as I already mentioned, the exercises, they um, usually involve mixed teams. So you also have, because of the studies, you have to interact with, um, maybe students from Linz and from, uh, from Vorarlberg as well. And so this gives you kind of like a bit of an exchange with um, people that are not in your uh, study location. And of course, um, like it's the 21st century, we also have like, um, uh, like digi digital means of connecting with each other. So what we have is like, we have like a, di a big Discord server 
um, where there are like all students, like in all locations, and we have WhatsApp groups. And um, I, I, I found them to work really well for just exchanging with other people and um, get, basically having opportunities to, to meet up. So my next my next concern was maybe there there won't be like no interactions with um, professors or lecturers, and maybe maybe this will uh, either result in like maybe a lack of opportunity if you like maybe want to do a PhD, or or maybe just that you don't do not take away as much from the studies as you could have like in a in a learning sense, and. I think this was very well solved with like just having multiple communication channels. So there's like a lot of opportunity how you can interact with your teachers and really like get the most out of the studies. So first there are live interactions. It's not that you're just like watching a video, but you can actually, if you want to interact during the lectures with the chat and the microphone and um, uh, they, they will answer your questions. And usually the courses also have um, like dedicated course forums. And you can just ask questions, questions there and students can discuss and um, usually you get uh, like your questions answered. Um, and of course, you can just contact your, your lecturer or your professor via email. And uh, generally, I found that they, they were very eager to help you out with any problem that you might have. And you, you just basically have to be proactive and reach out. So the next concern that I had uh, for the distance study was maybe it, it would be perceived as like not the real study and it wouldn't be like valued by employers that much like in a sense they say ah you did like kind of like an online certificate or so but um but actually this is this is not true so the, like i think this needs to be emphasized so the courses they're like exactly the same it's the identical degree and the professors they do not know whether you are in linz or in vorarlberg or in bregenz or or basically wherever so you can switch between these locations, as I said, and uh, you're learning the ex exact same things. So there's no distinction between local students and um, basically no remote students. And you can kind of like study from uh, wherever yeah, you feel like. And it's like the, the same, same course, the same materials, right? Um, and at least in, in my, my local network, there is, I, I think there was no no perceived difference in the, the opportunity for a distance versus the local uh, students in the sense that I have friends that now work at university after the masters. I have friends that work at startups and large companies and no one ever like, um, I don't know, talked about it. This is like something like a distance or something different. Yeah, and finally, um, I was just afraid maybe there will be like technical difficulties either that there is like no, no lecture recordings available or that the lecture recordings are very low, low quality. Maybe there are like laggy live streams and it's like not very enjoyable to, to, to watch. And so, um, so I think this was also like kind of like addressed in the sense that all the core machine learning and um, AI curriculum courses, they, they are offered online. So you usually have um, slides, you have recordings, you have live streams, you have lecture notes sometimes. Um, and these lectures are really, really high quality, I, I must say. So um, usually the lecturers, they, they use microphones. So you, they have like a technical team, they wear microphone phones and the, the videos are really nicely edited. For, for example, you can um, think of if the lecturer is like at the blackboard and is maybe deriving something. Then there's really like an actual like uh, like a camera person that um, sw switches basically the view from the from the screen view to um, to really follow like what the what the lecturer is um, is working there and zooming in and making sure that everything is like nicely visible. So so the the, the live streams and the videos are usually very good. And if there are sometimes problems, then the technicians were also like always very helpful at the, the distance centers or just if you write in a chat that something is not working properly with the sound. And the JQ was always like very, very um, like forthcoming and very, very open for the feedback. And one thing to note maybe here is that some elective courses that you could take as part of your master's studies, um, they, they, they are not offered online, but this is just because they are part of other JKU curricula, for example, computer science. So for these, you would actually need to go there but I found that there was like a very broad selection still in the main curriculum that are offered online. And I did, did not feel like that, that I missed out on anything 
like just because I was um, studying like on a distance. Yeah, and finally, just to speak a bit about like how is it to work and to study. So the distance studies, they are very flexible as like the, there is almost no mandatory attendance and the practical exercises, they, they were usually or mostly like take home assignments. So you get the problem sheet and you have then two weeks to, to solve it at, at, at home or just in your time. So um, you're very flexible. You can decide like, do I go to uni today or maybe there is something else. You just have to go there basically for the exams, right? Or you just have to watch the, the um, yeah. And so personally, uh, what I did, I worked 20 hours per week throughout my master's, like so part-time. And I found it at times intense, but I think it's, it's doable. Um, but, but this is like just like highly subjective, I would say, because I had prior experience in, in, um, in machine learning and my job was also related to that. So I, I did not have like a, a context switching cost, but, but I talked with other, other colleagues that like tried to work more work, like 30 hours or even full-time 40 hours and, uh, the university workload. So is, it is full-time. So, um, like if you if you work more, I would say then like it will come at the cost. Like it's a trade off. You will either uh, either work more on the weekends and it will cost you like more leisure time, or you will just study longer. So it's like more of a problem of uh, study duration. And uh, just now for some concluding words. So the the distance learning like offers you really a high degree of flexibility. First in location, like you can study wherever you want, and also in day to day studies in the sense that. Um, that uh, you can decide do, do I like just do I watch the live stream or do I watch the recording afterwards and so on. Uh, and I, I would say compared to other studies, and this is also like my personal experience with like previous studies, the, the JKU AI, uh, JKU AI is, is very work friendly. So um, like it, it gives you this freedom, but as always, it's a trade off and, and you need to uh, decide it like based on your current situation. Um, so it's, it's the same curriculum and degree as students in Linz. There is, is no difference for professors or I think also for uh, people uh, uh, outside of the university. And the distance uh, centers, they, these, they serve really as the initial meeting points to make local connections. So I would recommend uh, like to go there, at least in the beginning. Um, and also like there, there we have now digital places that connect students as well. We have Discord, Discord servers and, and WhatsApp. And the experience of viewing these lectures, they are very nicely made and it's like a great experience. Um, and, and it's also good that we can interact live uh, with the lecturers. And uh, with that, like if you have any question, let me know. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Niklas. I will now uh, stop the recording such that we are available for your questions. <laughs>